Hey, this is Tiger. Welcome to my stream. Good evening, AJ. Thank you for moderating my stream again. And uh, as I like to do at the start, please read the disclaimer that the game is putting in front of it. We are playing a computer game here. We don't want to interfere with the railway in real life. It is a dangerous place and we want to look into things as if they were real. But never forget that we are playing a computer game. Guten Abend, says CD Radar. What was it? Dobre Vecher to the Czech Republic, if I remember correctly. Nice to have you on the stream again. Today, I want to take you to the United States of America, to the state Wyoming and meet Sherman Hill. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to Sherman Hill, Cheyenne, Laramie, or the other way around in our case. And um, we have those beautiful diesel electric locomotives. Some of them we know from Sam Patch Great, like the GE AC. 4400CW or the EMD SD40-2 but today we are running the most modern locomotive in this setup the EMD SD70ACE in Union Pacific livery obviously locomotives diesel electromot electric mo locomotives in the United States are most of the time, either General Electric GE or EMD Electromotive Division, or at least that's what they were called in former times. Today, GE belongs to um, WAPTEC, I think, and EMD to Progress Rail, what in itself belongs to Caterpillar. Is that right? correct me in the comments if I am not. Well, what I wanted to do today is to drive one of those really long and heavy freight, freight services uh, that live in Sherman Hill and talk about route signaling. US American signaling, we know that from a lot of streams before, is a very fragmented matter because um, every railroad more or less can use their own operating rules with only a very limited set of basic rules that are set out in the federal regulations. Is that what I wanted to do? Dynamic weather in October, Laramie at 555. Yes, I think that's it. <clears throat> and a couple of railroads are using route signaling and the rest more or less speed signaling. Most of the signaling systems that we looked at so far in, in my videos were speed signaling systems where the signal aspects and indication will give you an um, order more or less, how fast you can go past the signal and so on. And now we are looking at route signaling. We have had one stream, the Cajon Pass one, where we well had a look at the route signaling at one route signaling system and today we want to look at this a bit more in depth. This is our service. We are supposed to go from Lar Laramie to Cheyenne. We are probably not doing the whole service. It is rated with one hour and 27 minutes and usually it takes longer if you're actually playing in the game. We are not doing the whole service today. I think we are driving past the summit at Sherman Hill and then uh, we will leave the rest for uh, another stream where we will, we will, where I want to look a bit at the cap signaling system. So you can see the data of the service is rather uh, crazy. Well, it's not that crazy. There are actually longer and heavier trains. The train that we are running is one of the smaller ones in this DLC. We only have 84 vehicles in the uh, train that is most probably 80 auto track auto rack cars so we are carrying automobiles from laramie to cheyenne 
and four locomotives of this kind, ST70 ACE UP livery, or sometimes they get replaced with the um, with the GE locomotive that we know from Sandpatch Grade the AC 4400CW. And the train is like we saw that just like this, it is well a bit more than 6,000 tons. That is not the heaviest train here in the DLC. Sometimes the trains are up to 15,000 tons, but it's quite long, 7,880.1 feet. This is our locomotive. I chose this setting because we are starting into sunrise. Nevertheless, I need some light. Can I find it here? Yeah, I found it almost here is the light switch. Now we have some light in the cap. You can see it's quite a modern cap. You have to insert obviously our reverse key to make the stand listen to us. Then the three buttons for engine run, generator field and fuel pump needs to be on. Number lights are already on, also the other lights. Then we need some bright headlights at the front. We don't need headlights at the end because we have the cars there. Then we need to set up our brakes and you can see that this 83 gives you the pressure for the brake pipe. We are already starting with an almost full brake pipe. Also at the rear, you can see it here with rear 83, the brake pipe pressure is already almost where it needs to be so that we can operate the train. And this was something that was changed after this DLC was uh, initially uh, released because people complained that it took so long to start the train with uh, charging the brakes or that they couldn't get the trains moving because they didn't know that they had to wait until the trains were charged and the brakes were released. The equalizing reservoir on the locomotive that we are controlling immediately with our brake uh, valve is at zero, but the brake pipe already has some pressure. This has some funny side effects because sometimes when you are coupling to uh, cuts of trains, they have already their brake pipe filled, so you couple to them and then they just roll or jump into your face. But whatever. So we went to this menu here to set up our brakes. We need to set it to lead. That is the independent brake so that we can operate the independent brakes on our four locomotives that are connected at the front end of the train and cut in so that we can operate the brake pipe that is more or less the only thing that works here on this uh, computer screen uh, as far as the uh, keys are concerned there is a button called length counter but it does not work so the operating controls with the two settings for the train brakes and the independent brake is the only thing that works. We can make it a bit brighter and a bit less bright. Always important when we are running more than one locomotive, like here, you can see it at least from the lights. We have one, two, three locomotives at the front end of the train. And if I look at the back end of the train, we have one locomotive at the end. So we need to set our banking com to on so that all the locomotives are following suit and listening to what I am doing on the locomotive here. Before releasing the brakes, always apply the independent brake that your train does not roll away while the brake system is charging and then the automatic brake to release. And then you can see that the equalizing reservoir is filling to the 90 PSI that we need to run this train. and. Uh, then the brake pipe will also fill the brake pipe. The pressure drop, dropped a bit because we were releasing the brakes here, but they will start filling again as soon as the equalizing reservoir is going up. Because the brake pipe will always follow the equalizing reservoir so that we have a fast reacting uh, pressure room with the equalizing reservoir so that we can see what is happening when we are moving our brake lever and the brake pipe will then adapt and you can see at the front end of the train it is almost at the 90 at the rear end it is always lagging behind a bit 
but as soon as the rear end is charged to 75 or 80 then typically we can start our train anything else that we need to do we can look at the fuse cabinet the buttons that are here we don't need them if the train is already set up what we want to have is the EAD fuse, this is the, this is the emergency alerter device, that is the alerter that, like the CIFA in Germany or the vigilance device in Great Britain, just checks if we are still there, if we are not operating controls. This will be the fuse to turn on the system that uh, enforces the cap signals, but I would strongly advise not to turn them on because the cap signaling system here is notoriously glitched and it will slow you down in a bad way. So we will just be driving according to the wayside signals and next stream we want to look a bit closer into the cap signaling system. This is the signal that we are getting and you all realize that the top one is red and the one below is green. And in a speed signaling system, you would probably think, okay, this is um, a medium clear, allowing us to go medium, but we are not in a speed signaling uh, system. We are in a route signaling system, and this is the classic diverging clear aspect in the route signaling system, telling us we can go with line speed, but we will diverge. And where are we going to diverge? at the next switch here, this switch. And how do we know how fast we can go across this switch? The signals are not telling us. We have to look it up in our timetable. In our operating rules, they tell us how fast we can go in the game. We don't have that. We have to look at the pause screen and we see that this switch allows a speed of 25 to pass through. So. The signal tells us we are going to diverge. The timetable tells us how fast we can go and this is what we are doing now. Let's say the dispatcher, we are ready to go and turn off the lights and then we start. I already moved the reverser to forward. Now I'm starting to rev up our prime mover a bit. You can see here in the tractive effort meter that we are building up traction effort and then I can release the independent brake and the train is moving. Let's open the window so we can hear horns and stuff better. You saw that the cap signaling system that is always here in the middle between the front windows turned off after passing the signals. We don't have any aspect on it. Whether this is prototypical because we are running in a part of the, tra the track where we are not getting any signal codes or whether this is part of the glitches of the cap signaling system. I don't know. The next thing is how do we deal with our train length? As soon as we are across the switch we can go faster than the 25. When we are passing this sign here for example, this is a speed sign telling us we can go 40 from here but how do we know without using the external cameras for that I got to my main stalk axle and how do I use axle to calculate that we know how fast we will be going until we can accelerate a bit below the limit so I put in there 23 miles per hour then I converted those miles per hour to feet per second as you can see here it's really small maybe I can make it a bit bigger um, Axel maybe I can make it bigger so that you can read it better is that better I wanted to have it on while we are uh, running the train, so this is why I did not want to make. But can you can you read it like this, AJ? Maybe it works like this. Perfect. Okay. So I converted the miles per hour that we are going through this bottleneck into feet per second. By this, I have to multiply it this with this factor here. 
if you are interested to know how I got there. One mile has 1760 yards in it and there are three feet per yard and then I know how many feet per hour we are traveling and then I divide it by 60 and one more by 60 then I know how many feet per second we are traveling and then I have this factor here and then I can calculate our feet per second and then I need to know the train length and the train length in feet is 7880.1 and then I know how many seconds it will take me to pass through this uh, bottleneck with my whole train this is 234 seconds and then I will punch in the timestamp when we are passing with the front end of the locomotive the speed changing point like now it is 6 13 and then actually gives us a timestamp 60707 and until 60707 I should be is there something in America that is not confusing <laughs> well with a with a working train length counter this would not be a problem right so we will see just just start accelerating after 60707 and then we will see if that worked out. I will try to keep on the 23 miles more or less. Obviously you have to allow for some margin of error because you're not always going the 23, sometimes you're a bit faster, then you're a bit slower. Here, by the way, we are passing for the first time the Interstate 80, I think it is, that we will meet later, or not today, but when you're running down from the Sherman Hill summit to... Um, to Cheyenne then the Interstate 80 will meet you again, twice I think, even. That is a... Uh, a highway that is not an interstate, I think it is Highway 287. Wyoming Highway 287. That we're going underneath. If you're playing this during day and have uh, sunlight and everything, it is quite funny going under these bridges because for some reason they forgot to implement the um, the capability of, the, of those roads to block the sunlight so they don't cast a shadow but the cars that are passing on the on the road on top of it they cast a shadow so you have those shadows of the cars running over the ground So now I am more or less on my 23 miles per hour that I was aiming for. And if you check it here on the pause screen you can see that this bottleneck is getting longer and longer and longer because our long train has to pass through it. And I will not look on the pause screen anymore. Obviously you can look on the pause screen and just check when you are through. Um, but if you want to play it a bit more realistically and not look on the pause screen, because in real life you would not have a pause screen, but a train length counter, then you can do it with the axle thingy. That simulates a train length counter more or less. Still have almost 
one you know, half a minute to go, a bit more than half a minute to go. The road on the left, I think, is Soldier Springs Road. And we are passing through an area where people obviously, at some point in history, w used to raise fish because it is uh, a town or a village here that, that has the name Forel, what is the same word as the German word, word for trout, Forelle. And obviously they raised those fish here. So now we pass the 707 on our clock and I'm accelerating. And now we will see whether we got it and you can see it is almost we, we almost made it with this calculation. So this this calculation here by the train length and the velocity works really quite well. So at least in the game the simulation of length and time and velocity makes sense, it works out. Now the signals that we are passing are to most probably automatic block signals that only have one signal head. They can be red or green or yellow. Or maybe they can even have a flashing yellow for an advanced approach. But this is pretty much what they can display. Let's open the back door so that we can have a bit more air in our cab. And you can see what is difficult in this DLC is that you can look towards the horizon in almost 360 degrees around you. So there's always the necess necessity to simulate all this and millions of blades of prairie grass And this led to a lot of performance issues in the beginning after this DLC was released initially. <clears throat> now our limit is 40. So we want to stay at about 38 miles so that we can see if the train is picking up speed. We have an accelerometer here on our cab showing 2.1 at the moment miles per hour per minute I think is the unit that it is showing us our speed increase but this is a bit well this accelerometer is, is working quite slowly and I have not found that you can really work with it very well. <laughs> By the way, we are going on the so-called new route at the moment approaching a level crossing I think this is the site that is called Forel 14L pattern
And those are those auto rack cars. There are actually cars in it, so street cars in in the meaning of automobiles. I think you can even open the doors and see the cars sitting inside those auto rack cars. Yeah, what I was saying, we're running on the so-called new line between Laramie and uh, Hermosa, what is short before we get to the Sherman Hill summit. The whole line across Sherman Hill was built, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in 1868 as part of the transcontinental railway that connected East Coast and West Coast and uh, was the part where the line coming from the east coast had to cross the rocky mountains and find a way where you can actually build a railway track that is not so super steep that it's still allowed for the trains to climb them and the first route was from 1868 and there is still if you look on the track diagram here a bit more to the west this is the old route and we are traveling on the new route and then at Hermosa they converge and then we are traveling on the well not completely but more or less on the old route to Cheyenne there is one more track that goes from uh, Dale Junction between Hermosa and Sherman a bit in the south to Cheyenne but this is not in the game unfortunately on the forums you can sometimes find people asking for this route being retrofitted would be a great thing I think there's a train coming from the opposite direction. We have to set our headlights to dim and not forget to set them to bright after we pass the train. The trains from the opposite direction always seem to set their lights to bright just before they get to us. But this is because of the rendering distance, obviously. This is a train made out of so-called covered hoppers. Hopper cars that carry or can carry things like grain or sand. Stuff. and now the train is done locomotives at the end we can go back to bright lights so I should say it is a very beautiful DLC but you need some time to run the services because it really takes you like two hours to get one train from Laramie to Cheyenne or the other way around. Yeah, the sunrise is nice, right? Actually, if I can, I always 
try to select services that are not running in the broad daylight. I might have mentioned this before. The hard lighting of daylight summer afternoon creates the most problems in the lighting system, I, I, I should say. I don't know if you can see that on the stream, even the signal lights, they cannot easily be distinguished between red and yellow, or amber as some people like to say. And I have seen some services here with harder light where you can almost not see the signal colors anymore. One more level crossing, you could see the sign with the X. The sign with the X warns you that there is a level crossing up ahead. And that you should start your 14L honking pattern. Typically those whistle boards no matter whether they have an X on it or a W for whistle. They are typically put up in a distance of a quarter mile to the level crossing. And if you are traveling with 45 miles per hour or faster, then you should start sounding your cadence as soon as you're passing the whistle board. So you should not use the horn before you pass the whistle board. And if you're traveling slower yes <laughs> w for warte but if you're traveling with a slower speed than 45 miles per hour then you're actually supposed to wait before you sound your cadence and you should start sounding it um, so that you can sound it for 15 to 20 seconds so you can again do the math and the calculations how many seconds you have to wait until uh, from uh, from passing the the whistle board until you have to start sounding your horn that was a short train This is a really lonely job, yeah? You name it. <laughs> like riding on Mars. <laughs> Oops, I didn't want to do this. On this train, you actually have to control the speed because with this setup here you'd actually be in a position where you could go faster than the 40 miles on other trains you just put the throttle to notch 8 and wait until you're uphill here we have the first rock formations that we can see we're getting out of the very very flat area and some of them are actually modeled very nicely you really feel like you're going on a hike on these formations here and it is said that uh, those formations here 
in the sunlight they show a, br a wide spectrum of different colors this is why the next village that we are passing is called colores like los colores in spanish for the colors what is maybe a bit more fortunate to be named after this than being named after a fish like the last village that we passed through isn't that nice So, before it is getting too lonely, I will put you all to sleep with starting the presentation and looking at the root signaling system. At the root signaling of Union Pacific. American signaling. Just to know where we are standing, American railway or railroad signaling is a very fragmented thing. We know that every railroad carrier has their own rules, their own signals and so on, but there is still something that is unified. This is the Code of Federal Regulations, that is federal law if you want it like this, so something that everyone has to comply with. Don't be frightened, I won't go through everything in this chapter here, section 236.23 aspects and indications for signals. This is more or less the only piece of law that tells you um, what your signaling system has to comply with. We had a look at this in streams before, so I will go through this quite fast. We have it this is more or less the basic provision aspects shall be shown by the position of semaphore blades, color of lights. This is the most important things. Aspects should be made out of color of lights. Cap signals shall be made out of lights or illuminated letters or numbers. So we have here a provision that allows us to have cap signals. Each aspect displayed by a signal shall be identified by a name and shall indicate action to be taken. So this is the trinity of um, aspect, name and indication that you can hear in every stream or video covering US signaling. Every signal has an aspect, that is the colors here. Uh, has a name like clear or medium approach and the indication telling you what to do. And uh, we have fundamental indications that need to be uh, followed in every signaling system. A red light shall be used to indicate stop. A yellow light or a lunar light shall be indicated to, uh, uh, shall be used to indicate restricted speed or that you are approaching a red light. So we have the yellow and the lunar white in the both of its functions first to be a warning that there is a stop incoming or to uh, make the train go in restricted speed and a green light should be the one that tells you to go on the maximum authorized speed. and. Uh, this is the provision that tells us if the signal goes dark for some reason, then you should treat it as a non-existing, uh, uh, then you should treat the dark signal as a red signal. Failsafe idea, um, if something breaks, treat it uh, the worst it can display. And then the names, indications and aspects of the signals and so on shall be uh, let out in the operating rules or the special instructions of the carrier. So here the Federal Court Code of Regulations allows every carrier to more or less specify their own signaling system within the outlines that are given in this section here. And we have already seen that 
Some carriers are actually doing their own stuff, others more or less tried to get something unified like the NORAC uh, committee that we uh, had a look at in the Boston stream, especially led by Amtrak and, and uh, all the other carriers that are running on Amtrak own territory. And the nice thing about the NORAC rules is that they have the signal specifications already in the NORAC rules. AJ is asking, is it the same in Greece as it is in the US that there are many different uh, rule systems? Just asking because of that uh, recent accident. I don't think so. I do not know a lot about the Greek system and the signaling rules, but I don't think that it is fragmented like this uh, because the railway system in Greece is rather small. There are not that many lines and uh, well, I don't know if there are actually more than one carrier that does uh, long distance trips and whether they can specify their own rules or the signaling rules um, are given by the state, uh, I don't know. I, I, I have not researched that uh, more thoroughly. Uh, regarding the recent accident, um, well, there are a lot thi of things that you can say about this accident. but. Uh, when you hear that dispatchers are allowing the train drivers to pass red signals just by uh, spoken order, then it doesn't really matter what signaling system you have, then this is prone to error and mayhem, I think. In the United States, obviously something different AJ. thank you yeah um back to the back to the uh, american system we were talking about the norac rules that we had in in the boston dlc and uh, now on the new york trenton dlc that we are following in there and the nice thing is that we have all the signal aspects specified in the norac rules rules 280a and following and you have a page where you have all the possible combinations of colors and position lights and so on. And uh, you have a corresponding uh, row telling you what the name of the signal is and what you are supposed to do. So you have the aspect, you have the name and you have the indication, for example, for the clear signal here. And this is like a catalog with all the possible signals. Others like the MTA Long Island Railroad or the MTA Metro North that we had a look at in the corresponding videos, they more or less have their own signals. Some of them are f a bit familiar or, or not unlike the NORAC rules. You um, can see that the NORAC rules also have some position lights like the Long Island Railroad, um, but they have their own set of rules and they are independent. They are not NORAC, they are doing their own stuff. And then we have all the lines that more or less cooperate in the GZOR, the General Code of Operating Rules. Um, and they uh, have a provision in the GZOR that says signal aspects and indications should be specified by the special instructions of the carrier. So we have here a unified code of operating rules for those uh, carriers, but this operating rules code does not include the signal aspect, but this is done in the special instructions of the carriers. And we had a look at the Caltrain rules, for example, um, within the GCOR uh, in, in the Baby Bullet stream. We had a look uh, at the BNSF, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe rules uh, in the Cajon Pass stream. And now we are looking at the Union Pacific Railroad rules in this stream here, just so that we know where we are standing and what we are talking about. Now let's have a look on the possible aspects that we can see in the Union Pacific uh, signaling system. Obviously, this is our matrix where I always try to put everything and all the signal aspects so that we can see for what combination we have actually signals and for what uh, for, for what indication we have not. 
obviously on the top there is line speed then stop and restricted the restricted speed is we have seen that already provisioned for in the general code of now in the federal code of regulations we must have some way to tell the train to go restricted but this is more or less the basic set so U union pacific and i'm talking only about freight trains here Union Pacific is mostly freight trains and um, passenger trains have a bit of different speeds and rules and aspects, but I'm talking about freight trains here only. Obviously, they need to have a stop signal and they need to have a clear signal. This is code of regulations. Then they need to have an approach signal, typically with the yellow on top, and they need to have something that tells us to go restricted. This can be the lunar. Every signal that has a lunar anywhere tells us to go restricted. Then we have seen that on the Caltrain stream, sometimes we have fully red signals and one of the red lamps is flashing. That is also a restricting signal that allows us to pass the signal with restricted speed. And then they have this funny contraption here with a red flashing light set to the side of the red signal. This is also a restricting signal. I have not seen it in the game so far. I think there are some signals that seem to allow this because they have a signal head that is a bit put to the side. Um, yeah, so the yellow light for a restricting signal in the Union Pacific uh, signaling system is only here. So we have seen that on the NORAC rules, for example, we have the yellow light on the bottom most signal head to indicate that it is restricted and on the top most to indicate that it is an approach. Here we have it set to the side a bit, the yellow light to indicate that this is a restricted signal. And restricted is max maximum of 20 on um, half side, I think. And we already have seen that a couple of times. Sometimes the approach signals can give you already an order that you have to slow down. And as a freight train, we have to slow down at once to 30 when we are passing an approach signal so that we can stop in front of the red signal that is supposed to follow. Also, this we have seen quite some time. If the yellow lamp on top is flashing, then we have an advance approach signal telling us the next signal will be an approach signal and the second signal will be a stop signal. And this one is already connected with the order to slow down to 40 if you are a freight train. So this is the velocity funnel. At this signal, slow down to 40. At this signal, slow down to 30 and then stop. We have what we do not have in all systems, an approach restricted signal. That is the flashing red used here or the lunar white with the yellow lamp on top. The yellow lamp on top always tells you approach and then you look on the next signal head underneath to see what you are approaching, whether you are approaching a red signal like on the approach signal or whether you are approaching a restricted signal like on those here. Obviously we also have a stop and proceed signal. This is the red signal with the number plate. This tells you to stop, look and then proceed if everything is safe but with restricted speed. That is the equivalent of the stop sign on the road. And uh, has an indication that lies between those two things because you have to stop but you don't need to stay there uh, until the signal changes but you can proceed with restricted speed afterwards and need to stay at restricted speed until you get a better or more favorable signal and now <clears throat> the fun begins you see all, all the all the area in between between line speed and restricted in, in the signaling system that we had a look before speed signaling systems. We had the limited and medium and slow speeds that were signaled by moving the green lamp uh, downwards on the signal hats. And this is not really done in a root signaling system that we have here. Uh, we are using this um, this tool of moving our green lamp downwards to indicate that we are diverging. So 
all the diverging aspects will be shown with this blue uh, box around it to show that they are diverging signals. So if this on the right is a clear signal moving down the green light, uh, it will tell you that it is a diverging signal. It tells you to diverge from the main line or prepare to diverge. And it does not give you a speed for that, but you have to look it up in your timetable if you don't know it by heart. And this is done with a lot of other signals too. So with most of the signals that we have seen so far, you can have a diverging version of it telling you to diverge. And then um, the rest of the indication is typically what comes from the non-diverging version. So we have a diverging approach signal telling you after this signal, go on the diverging line you have to look up how fast you can go, but not faster than 30, because the next signal will be read after the diverging. And the same on the advance approach signal. Diverging, advance, approach. You diverge now and have to ask, expect that the next signal is an approach one, and the second signal after that is a red one. And this also tells you to slow down to 40 as a freight train, just as the advanced approach signal would. So you see here the same ruling principle, moving down the, uh, the light one signal head and you have the diverging aspect. So you can see the topmost tells you the straight route and you are not allowed to go the straight route, but you are supposed to go the diverging route. And this allows you to go to, through the diverging route, but you have to expect that the second signal after that will be read. So, based on this, we have some more aspects that we do not have in a speed signaling uh, system. This here tells you to expect a diverging signal at the next signal. For that, it is called an approach diverging. So if you have two yellow lamps on top, or the topmost and the bottommost in yellow, then this warns you that you are approaching a signal of that kind, for example, a signal that tells you to uh, diverge. And then you can look into your timetable and then you know at what speed you have to be when you are running uh, across the turnout. And we have also a diverging aspect of this. So if we move those two yellow lamps one step down, we end up with this here. And this is a diverging approach, diverging signal. Sounds a bit weird, but it tells you you have to diverge now and you have to expect that you have to diverge again at the next signal. All the time, not giving you any indication how fast you can go on the turnout. You have to know it or look it up in your timetable. It just warns you about when you are diverging and when you are not diverging. Still, there are some signals that carry information about how fast you can go on the next switch and turnout. And those are mostly turnouts that allow a somewhat higher speeds than in the beginning. For example, there is this signal here that is an approach clear 60 signal that tells you that at the next signal you have to go not faster than 60. And um, at the same time, if you uh, look up the indication that is stated in the rules, it tells you if at the next signal there is a turnout that allows you to go with 60, then you have to expect that you are going through the turnout. If you turn that around, if there is no turnout or a turnout that allows you to go on a different speed, then you are supposed to expect that you are not diverging. The interesting thing is that we have this only as an approach signal. There is, at least not in the rules that I have seen, there is no clear 60 signal itself, but only the approach clear 60 signal. Only the approach signal, not the 
Clear 60 version of it. And as a freight train, we are supposed to already start slowing down to 60. The same thing works with Clear 50, not flashing. 50 at next signal, slow down to 50 at once as a freight train, and if the turnout that is governed by the next signal allows you to go with maximum 50, then expect to go across the switch. If not, then expect not to go across the switch, but straight on. And for this clear 50 in the rules that I have seen, there is a diverging aspect. Diverging approach clear 50. Did I put it on? No, I did not put the name on it, but it is a diverging approach clear 50 signal telling you you are diverging now and at the next signal you have to expect that you can't go faster than 50 and if there is a 50 switch then uh, expect the diverging. You can see those signals are quite specific and I have not found really any reliable information in what contexts they are used but uh, from what you can read in the rules you can at least uh, find out in what situations they might be used. And then for this we have only a diverging main aspect that is connected with a speed of 40. Here we do not have an approach aspect and not a diverging approach aspect but we have a diverging clear aspect. This is a diverging clear limited that allows us to go 40 or maximum 40 on the switch that is after the signal. So this is a bit like the clear uh, or the diverging clear. It's like, a bit like the diverging clear, but it is limited. So you can see if you take this signal and have the middle lamp flashing, then you are actually, yeah, it depends either downgrading or upgrading it because this can um, allow you to go 15 on the switch or 75. You don't know, you have to look it up in your timetable with this one. It is connected with a 40 speed. But here we have only the diverging aspect. We don't have a non-diverging clear aspect and we don't have an approach aspect for it. At least not in the set of rules that I have seen. And so I tried to put all the aspects that are in the rules in my matrix to see where we have signals and where we have not. I think that is that on the stream that I'm planning to do not necessarily next week, but sometime soon. On the Sherman Hill, I want to look at how cap signals are connected with those signals here and what aspects the cap signaling system is supposed to show in what case of what wayside signal and so on. But you can see, we have a root signaling system. It is dominated by using the signal aspects to tell the engineer whether he is diverging from the main line or whether he is staying on the main line. And then we have some elements of speed signaling where the signals tell or where already the signals tell the engineer how fast he can go at least on the diverging line. And now before we go back to our train I wanted to have a look at how those signals can be arranged actually on the track. You can see I have my track and it is diverging here and from this track it is diverging again. So this is my exemplary track and let's see how the different signals can appear on a track like this. Most easy solution is clear not diverging. Blue line tells us what we are supposed to go and this is obviously trivial. We always have a clear signal. The next one is clear once diverging. Looks like this. The blue line going here, then we are diverging and on the next one we are going straight ahead. We know already that we will be getting clears here or whatever. Let's say we have a clear here and then we get a diverging clear at this point. 
diverging clear telling us we have to diverge. We don't know how fast we can diverge, we have to look it up in the timetable. And this diverging clear can be or will be most probably be announced by the approach diverging so that we know, aha, at the next signal we have to diverge. And before the approach diverging, I think we should get clears. It is technically possible to think that maybe we get an advanced approach here because the approach diverging is an approach signal and the ap advanced approach has a provision in its description that we do not necessarily need to expect um, a red light at the second signal after it but if we see in the approach that we are getting a not a, a normal approach but something else that tells us that the second signal is not a red that we can go on with line speed. Maybe there are situations where we want to slow down the trains to 40 at this point to prepare them for um, a slower turnout here but typically I don't know if this is done, if this can be done, if this is a thing in the game I've not seen it. In the game I think I have always seen a clear before we get to the approach diverging. That is this one. 1C, clear, twice diverging. That is this line. We are diverging and then we are diverging again. And from here on, we are getting clear signals again. We already know we get an approach diverging, then we know, oh right, we will diverge at the next signal. But then we don't get the diverge clear, the diverging clear, but we get this funny signal that tells us diverging, approach, diverging. It tells us we are diverging now. And we don't know how fast we can go. We have to look it up in the timetable. And at the next signal, we will diverge again a second time. So we will get the diverging clear here. Again, we have to look into the timetable how fast we can go on this turnout. And before that, most probably the clear. So you can see this progression if you are diverging twice. If we have stops, so this is uh, case 0a again here, progression to stop, not diverging. The line is going this way and here is the red stop signal. You will get an approach before you get to the red stop signal, before that you get an advanced approach and before that you are clear. That is typical, that you see in a lot of systems in, 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 in the American signaling system, the same in speed signaling system. And here it will flag you down as a freight train at the advanced approach you have to slow down to 40 and at the approach you have to slow down to 30 and then approach the red signal in a way that you can stop in front of it. Progression to stop once diverging after the approach would look like this. So your track is that you're diverging once and at the next possibility you're going straight ahead. And you, let's say, have the stop signal here. Then you get before the stop signal a diverging approach. It is the normal approach, but move down one signal head so that it is an approaching uh, and diverging approach, telling you to diverge now and prepare to stop at the next signal. At the same time, it is slowing you down to 30 unless the turnout speed is lower Then obviously you have to stay below the turnout speed. And before that, probably you will get an advanced approach that slows you down to 40. But not necessarily. It is, at least, you could think that because you are approaching a diverging line, you can get an approach diverging. Which of them will be shown in those cases, I can't tell you. Would be interesting if anyone knows, please leave a comment and tell us. What there is not, at least I have not found it in the rules, an, um, an ac aspect that tells you that you are diverging and the second signal after that will be red. I think that the advanced approach with the order to slow down to 40 is the more restricting signal, so you will be getting probably this and not the approach diverging. What you could do if you're designing signaling systems you could have the topmost lamp on this signal flash flashing yellow over non-flashing yellow over red and then you had an 
advanced approach and advanced diverging both. But this is not in the rules, so this is just uh, me going crazy about what you could do. So I guess most probably you will get the advanced approach before you get the diverging approach here. But please tell me in the comments if you have better knowledge for this. And before that, you obviously get the clears before you get to the advanced approach. Case OC, progression to stop once diverging, and now we are not diverging after the uh, approach signal, but after the advanced approach signal. But look like this, our track is, our route is diverging once, then it is going straight ahead. There is the red signal, and here is the normal progression and approach signal in front of the red signal, and here we have our diverging advanced approach signal that is in the uh, rules. Tells us to diverge now and to be prepared that the second signal um, will be red. Here we have to slow down to 40. Unless the turnout speed is slower, then we obviously have to uh, keep below the turnout speed. At this approach here would be the order to slow down to 30 like always and before that I think there uh, nothing prevents us to warn the engineer that he will be diverging at the next signal so probably we will get an approach diverging at this point here and before that clears progression to stop twice diverging now we are diverging here, then we are diverging again, and then we get the red signal. How does that look like? We get the diver diverging approach signal here, telling us to diverge. No faster than 30, unless the turnout speed is slower. Be prepared to stop at the next signal. And we have the diverging advanced approach here, telling us to slow down to 40, until, unless the turnout speed is slower, and to expect to stop at the second signal after that. Before that, most probably approach diverging because this is a diverging aspect, aspect and we have nothing else that we need to tell the driver and before that clear. Okay, this is already the cap signaling thingy that I want to try covering in the next stream. Yeah, I just wanted to have a look and those two um, we are sets of progressions once just the diverging signaling with no stop signal and then the progression to stop with a bit of diverging in front of it. I hope this was not too confusing and, and, and made uh, it a bit clearer how this system is supposed to work. Always with a grain of salt, obviously I did not design the system and I never worked for Union Pacific and if you have um, better um, if you have better knowledge, let us know but this is what I can read out of the operating rules and the descriptions. Let's drive our train home and have a look on some of the aspects that we just discussed. We have already seen uh, when we started the diverging clear aspect. And I think we should get at least an approach diverging. You can see how this indicator here lights up when we are using the horn and the bell. You can't really hear the bell from the cab, but you can see it on the indicator that it is still on. When I turn off the bell, the indicator goes dark. Yeah, again, CD radar. Is there anything 
in the United States that is not confusing. Well, <laughs> I guess every system is confusing in a way and every system has its logic. And what I love about looking into all these things is how you can see the many different approaches that people have more or less to the same problems. And with how many clever solutions people come up with. Next signal is still clear as far as, as far as I can see. Well, we have only four more miles to go until we get to Hermosa. Hermosa is, from what you can read on the internet, a site where rail fans tend to camp and take pictures of the trains passing by. And a lot of those, of the services here in the game they end at Hermosa or start at Hermosa, so you can complete the service there and then drive on the next to Cheyenne. We're getting to a piece of track where we are passing through through those little gaps where you can see where people must have used explosives to make way for the train or the tracks more like Aha, now we get an advanced approach 
That orders us to slow down to 40. At the same time, we're getting a restricted on the cab signaling system. This is why I turned it off. Because obviously... We don't want to slow down to 20 already. And we don't want to get a penalty break for not slowing down to 20. So this is one of those parts where I think that they made room for the tracks by using explosives. The advanced approach ordered us to slow down to 40, but we are already not going faster than 40, so we can keep our speed. But at the moment we have to expect that we have to stop at the second signal. Here you can see the so-called new line coming in. It is a unidirectional line. It was built at about 1900, I think. So 30 years newer than the line that we are traveling on. And I think after this band there should be some signals. And will be interesting what we are getting. If we can see it at all. Yeah, you can see it. We are getting a yellow over yellow. What is an approach diverging signal? Not a diverging approach diverging, but a di uh, an approach diverging. We are not diverging now, but we have to expect to diverge at the next signal. And at the same time, we saw that we got the progression advanced approach approach diverging you might remember when I discussed that it is possible to have this progression or just a clear signal in front of it here obviously we got the progression with the advanced approach before we get the approach diverging and at the same time now we know that the second signal after the adv advanced approach is probably not red because we did not get an sim a simple approach and we did not get an a signal that warned us about the next signal being red but that we have to diverge at the next signal and if we look on our timetable we can see that the diverging track at the next signal is one that requires us to go with only 15 miles across the turnout. So it is quite well that they warned us that we are supposed to diverge here. So we can already prepare for that. and get our speed down. It's always a bit of a challenge to lose speed when you're driving uphill so that you are slow enough but don't stall the train and do not lose too much speed. So having to use the brakes actually would be almost devastating so you always have to play a bit with the gradient to see 
if the gradient is enough to slow you down properly. We can already see the signals. We can see that we have a diverging clear. Still have to you to lose two miles per hour until we hit the turnout and at the same time be prepared not to lose too much speed now we are good I think objective marker and here the diverging clear going across this slow turnout and again we probably want to use the train length counter in axle and now we are at Oh, 35, 10 I think it was, this is the wrong one, and we will have to wait until 42.03, until we can accelerate, <coughs> that was the alerter, you could see on, on the display the alerter warning, lighting up and we are now going across a peak a summit you can see the Hamosa tunnel coming up and at the entrance of the Hermosa tunnel there will be the summit so we are still going uphill and uh, as soon as we reach the entrance to the tunnel the gradient will change and we will be going downhill so we will have to grade. And grading is always an interesting procedure with the long train because we know that as soon as the tip of the train has passed the summit the center of gravity of the train is still on the other side and while more and more of the train is passing the summit more weight will be pulling the train down on the other side and less weight will holding it back on the side that we are coming from and we will have to balance that out and at some point we will be picking up speed and then we have to get our throttle out so that we can wait 10 seconds until we throw in the dynamics the dynamic brake And all the same, we have to not violate the 15 miles per hour limit of the turnout. So this is a nice thing to practice how you can control your heavy train while grading and while using the throttle and the dynamic brake. So after this tunnel we will run downhill but only a short part then we will get to a point that is called Dale Junction. This is where the line that is not represented in the game will diverge. It's written right like the Dale in, in The Hobbit but it is a different place I can assure you there won't be a dragon
just so that you see where our where the end of our train is the end of our train has still to pass the signal Fortunately, I cannot watch the end of our train for too long. Otherwise, I won't. I, I will miss the point where I can where I can uh, set the throttle to zero and uh, start preparing using the dynamic brakes. You can see at the moment throttle is at notch two. We are still on the steady speed of 13 miles because still parts of the train have to go across the turnout my improvised train length counter told us that at 4203 we can actually think about accelerating a bit more well we are enjoying the sun rise sometimes the lighting creates really nice effects here are those uh, snow fences don't look stupid because they have a tendency to to look stupid sometimes sometimes they appear extremely black and blotchy So I think we are getting to a point where the train wants to pick up speed. Center of gravity is not completely across the summit, probably. Still need to use notch 1 to not slow down. Don't forget the honking procedure for the level crossing at the next signal. So, according to my improvised thingy, we should be good to accelerate, and we are. And yeah, this looks this looks cool with the sunrise here. So, what I will be doing, I will be driving this train down the little hill to the Dale Junction that is starting here already you can see that there is a diverging track to the right that is another challenging uh, maneuver here now you're across the summit, now you are across the turnout, you can accelerate to 40 again. But if you just keep the throttle on until you hit the 40, running downhill, you probably won't be able to stay at 40 then and you will accelerate even more because you can't just yank the throttle to zero and yank the dynamic brakes in they always tell you to wait caution do not move dynamic brakes to set up until throttle has been in idle for 10 seconds this is to protect the traction motors to use the dynamic brakes you have to change the polarity in the traction motors and they need some time to change around 
So always keep that in mind and leave enough room for the train to accelerate after you started coasting. Here it is not so super crucial because the gradient will change after this little hilly on the right. You can see that the track to the right will leave us and go or will pass the, that little hill on the right side. Isn't that a beautiful landscape? Looks a bit like driving on Mars, I have to admit. But I enjoy that very much. And here the light in the cap. This looks good. So here's the point where the other line is diverging. And if we were to drive uh, all the way to Cheyenne, we would meet this line again shortly before we go into Cheyenne Yard. There is another opportunity to go on this southern line at a place called Bori, I think. Where there is a shooting range that is actually represented in the game. So you can see the, the shooting range installations there. Now we have passed Dale Junction and now we are going uphill again. At least the tip of the train is going uphill. Most part of the train is still running downhill. So we are accelerating even with the throttle in idle. But I want to have enough momentum to almost go our 40 on the way uphill to the summit at Sherman. Yeah, now we are losing speed when we're coasting. That means center of gravity has run through the dale and is on its way up. So we have to apply throttle. So I think this is the area where this village dale is. And there is no lake. And there is no mountain. And there is no dragon. Now what I can do is take this out of the picture. And soon enough we will get to Sherman and the summit at Sherman Hill. And this is where I will end this stream today. Because you can see on the mission objective marker on the top left, it is still 30 miles to Cheyenne.
and we should do this next time. Next time we will most probably run a service that starts at Hermosa. This is the place where we diverged before getting to the tunnel. Driving this bit again here, passing Dale and the summit and then running downhill all the way to Cheyenne, passing the granite quarry, passing the chemical facility at Wycon, passing the shooting range at Bori. running underneath the Interstate 80 twice. And then we will have a look on this machine here, the cap signaling machine. That gives us so such weird indications or aspects. So I'm really happy with this DLC here, but I have to admit it is something for people who have the calm to actually do those lonely two-hour rides with a super heavy train, where for long stretches of time nothing happens and then you need to be there and do the grading and not go too fast so that your train does not run away on downhill here you can see some of those weird effects that come from the snow fences and this is the summit we made it this is the summit at Sherman you can see the sign approaching or us approaching the sign. Sherman Hill. And now the tip of the train has passed and the grading process needs to be done once more. And I think with this I conclude the stream for today. Have the train running downhill. And next time we get back to this DLC we will look at some signal progressions with the signals that we did not look at progression wise in this stream. With a look at the cap signaling system. How it is working in the game and how it is probably supposed to work and maybe we do the long drive from Hermosa to Cheyenne for today thank you for bearing with me on this long and lonely trip and with those impressions from the sunrise at Sherman Hill I conclude the stream thank you very much take care and see you next time.